Word of God comes to us this morning in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 1 to 11. This is the Word of God. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, to the church of God that is in Corinth, with all the saints who are in the whole of Achaia, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our affliction, so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. For as we share abundantly in Christ's sufferings, so through Christ we share abundantly in comfort too. If we are afflicted, it is for your comfort and salvation. And if we are comforted, it is for your comfort which you experience when you patiently endure the same sufferings that we suffer. Our hope for you is unshaken, that we know that as you share in our sufferings, you will also share in our comfort. For we do not want you to be unaware, brothers, for the affliction we experienced in Asia. For we were so utterly burdened beyond our strength that we despaired of life itself. Indeed, we felt that we had received the sentence of death. But that was to make us rely not on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. He delivered us from such a deadly peril, and he will deliver us. On him we have set our hope that he will deliver us again. You also must help us by prayer, so that many will give thanks on our behalf for the blessing granted us through the prayers of many. The grass withers, the flowers fade, but the word of our God will stand forever. Amen. Thank you for that reading, Phil. That was with a great voice, and thank you, Joel, for the prayer. Good morning, church. 11 o'clock is definitely more livelier than 9 o'clock. I've been encouraging our 9 o'clock congregation to... Uh, you know, get more uh, alive and awake, but uh, it's been a struggle. <clears throat> uh, today we're starting a new series in 2 Corinthians, and uh, the reason why we're not starting from 1 Corinthians is because they've already preached on 1 Corinthians uh, twice, in fact, over the past 14, 15 years, and so uh, finally decided to do 2 Corinthians for the first time, so here we are. And because it's our first time, it would be appropriate for me to offer some explanation as to what this letter is about and why Paul decided to write it. Also, Pastor Shion encouraged me to share my heart behind this series. And so I'll just put it this way. You know, we, we've been uh, journeying through Zechariah for many, many weeks uh, leading up to the spring revival, and the call has been to return to the Lord, right? And so the assumption is that uh, many of you have rekindled your affection for the Lord. You've, you're here, right? So we're here now. So what do we do now that we're here? And so we want to now, once again, uh, deal with the nitty-gritty of life and ministry. And so uh, the best way to do that is to dive into the New Testament, especially Corinthians, because it was a messy church. And every church has a messiness about it. And so we want to, as faithful members... Uh, understand how we can faithfully navigate through the messiness of life together. And that's my heart behind this series. Here are a few things you should know <clears throat> about this church and the city that this church was established in. You know, first of all, the Corinthian church was established during the Apostle Paul's second missionary journey uh, around the year AD 50. Uh, Paul had invested a good 18 months in teaching members and raising up leaders so that this church can properly function. But the city of Corinth, uh, you can think of it as like the ancient New York. It was a, it was a big city, bustling, diverse, uh, but also that typically means a very corrupt city uh, where immorality, especially the sexual kind, was rampant. This also meant that the people who became Christians in Corinth would have felt that much more pressure, right? this greater pressure to conform to the patterns of the world and culture around them. And so to put it simply, uh, not too far into the church plant, the Corinthian church became a very messy church. Uh, the church became enamored by leaders who had much more charisma than Paul, uh, and so the church became divided, and 1 Corinthians deals a lot with, uh, you know, the, Paul talks about the division of the church and how uh, you, you, know, you need to pursue unity as believers. 
But on top of this division, uh, they uh, abuse their spiritual gifts. And so instead of using their gifts to edify the larger body of Christ, they use their gifts to bolster their own image and ego. Uh, They were sexually immoral, and uh, the sin in the church was not being properly addressed. Basically, the church was a mess, and Paul needed to address this church rather frequently. Now, we only have access to two of Paul's letters uh, written to this Corinthian church, but in reality, we know, based on what Paul wrote, that there were at least four separate letters written to this church. And again, it was because of the number of fires that Paul had to put out. So this may surprise you, but what we know to be 1 Corinthians is actually the second letter Paul wrote to the church, okay? Try to get that in your mind. You're not going to be used to it if you had never thought of it that way, okay? So 1 Corinthians, the one we covered many years ago, that's the second letter, okay? And after Paul wrote his two letters, he felt the need to visit the church in person with the hope that they would receive his instruction better face-to-face, right? Right? But he later referred to that particular trip as a very painful visit because there was a significant faction in the church that ended up challenging Paul's authority in his face. And it didn't go all that well. It wasn't as fruitful as he would like it to be. And so some of you know this, but it, it could have been partly because Paul in person was not a very impressive figure. Okay, he, he, uh, there was nothing physically impressive about him. <laughs> uh, you would not have liked him if you, probably, uh, if you saw him in person. He wasn't blessed with good looks or with a commanding stature. And so some in the church were arguing that, look, you know, Paul, your life is filled with too much suffering for you to even be considered an apostle. I mean, they just had no respect for this guy, basically, right? You know, look very good. You know, he's always, you know, traveling, just suffering, you know, shipwrecked, being stoned, almost, almost killed, stoned to death. I mean, you know, how, how can we prop this guy up to be our leader? Right? That was their sentiment. And so as a follow-up to that painful visit, <clears throat> he felt the need to write a third letter, which he describes in 2 Corinthians to be a very tearful letter. I mean, he poured out his soul, I guess, in that letter, And he basically pleads for the Corinthian church to repent of their worldliness. Thankfully, by God's grace, he receives news that the Corinthian church responds fairly well to that third letter. But he also learns that there's a minority. There was was a minority in the church that still remained obstinate and unrepentant, uh, questioning Paul's authority still, which leads to this fourth and final letter, which is known to us to be 2 Corinthians. And so there you go. That's the history. That's the backdrop. But think about this, brothers and sisters. Because there were people in the church questioning his authority, right, simply based on the amount of suffering he had received throughout his life, the Apostle Paul is now forced to explain clearly the place and purpose of suffering in the Christian life. He has to do this because they're using this against him. And so the first question that I wanted us to think about this morning is, what is God's purpose for suffering? And it's a question that we've already dealt with many times on different occasions, and I'm sure you've you've thought of it before, but, you know, uh, let's start with the general sort of, way of answering this. What is the purpose of suffering? You know, we often say that suffering is meant to sanctify us and make us more like Christ, and that's one of the primary reasons why God has us suffered through life, and that's true. That is totally true, but this passage gets more specific and says this. Let me read verse 3 and 4 once again. Listen carefully. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all 
comfort, who comforts us in all our affliction, so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. Okay, so think about that. What, what does this teach us specifically about the purpose of suffering? And I want to respond in two ways based on what this passage teaches us, okay? So number one, first, we're told that God brings forth suffering and affliction in our lives so that we could receive God's comfort. That's the first component, but that's not the full, full picture. That's not the whole story, right? The thought continues in this way. And by the way, this is the vision you should have for each of your lives as you yourselves suffer through life in different ways, okay? It says we receive God's comfort so that, that's important, okay, so that we may be able to comfort others with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God, okay? What this is saying is that when we're comforted by the God of comfort himself, we're given this new human capacity to comfort others, it's like a supernatural ability almost, something we haven't had before because we didn't know any better. You know, it's like unless you've actually suffered for your faith because you've spoken out against maybe the cultural lies of our day, right, you won't be able to credibly minister to people or, or comfort people who are experiencing similar sufferings now, you see. You won't be able to minister to them. In fact, they won't, they won't care about what you have to think if, if you're just someone who's always, you know, playing the passive game and not saying anything and not, you know, living or acting like a Christian. Why would they come to you and, and seek any help? In the same way, unless you've lived through the ups and downs of marriage and have fought, like seriously fought, to keep your marriage together, you won't be able to meaningfully offer comfort to those couples who are experiencing marital hardship now who need help. You simply won't have that capacity. I mean, can a, can a single man or single woman offer wise counsel on the topic of marriage? Sure they can. Right? All they got to do is echo scripture and they offer wise counsel. But we all know, brothers and sisters, that there's more to counseling than just speaking true propositions about God or marriage or his purpose for marriage, you know? People want to know that they can trust you as they share their deepest struggles, that you can understand what they're going through and really sympathize or empathize with them. Pray for them earnestly, you see. I thought about our staff as well, our pastoral staff. You know, we've been taking turns offering our grace stories, and finally mine's out. And so, But, you know, I, I still remember when our other pastors were sharing, when I first heard their stories in greater detail, I was like, shocked. Especially with uh, Pastor Shiong and Pastor Andrews. Like, what? You guys experienced what? That's crazy, right? It's like people have experienced these unexpected panic attacks and suffer through a season of severe anxiety or depression, right? They're the ones who are able to meaningfully speak into the lives of those who suffer from those same hardships. I confess, I, 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 didn't, I never had a serious panic attack. I mean, I get, like all of us, I get anxious at times. I'm anxious now even, right? But I, I, never, I never experienced like a serious panic attack. I don't, I don't understand that. I, I can't relate to that. I'm sorry. And I wouldn't be surprised if none of you, you ever approached me and said, you know, you know, Pastor Paul, can you help me through my panic attacks? All I can really do is, you know what, I'll pray for you. <laughs> i pray for you. I, I, I don't quite understand why you're so, you know. But you know what? You know who can help you? You know who you would really be able to connect with? Like Pastor Xiong or Pastor Andrew, right? Because they, they understand fully, like much, much better. Because they've been through it, you see. I mean, did any of you lose respect for your pastors as they were openly sharing about their own past and present struggles through our, you know, recent podcast? Right? Anybody lose respect? No, right? All of you probably, you felt 
closer to them, you felt like now, now they can actually effectively minister to me. Now I can actually listen to them better, right? I'm sure that's most of your, the way you're processing that. I've heard this said recently. You, you will always find it easier to trust someone who walks with a limp. Right? Haven't you found that to be true? Here's another helpful quote by a Protestant British preacher from several decades ago, I believe. He wrote, God does not comfort us to make us comfortable. Okay, don't think that's the main purpose of God offering you comfort. He doesn't comfort you to simply make you feel comfortable, okay? It says he comforts us to make us comforters. There's a purpose. That's what this passage, that's, that's one of the main key concepts from this chapter. God comforts us so that we can be comforters for others. Not so that we can be made comfortable in this life. And that is what the Apostle Paul is basically saying to his accusers who are questioning his apostleship, right? His accusers perceive his personal suffering as a human weakness and liability. But he says, no, you don't get it, right? My personal suffering is not a weakness or liability. It's rather a kingdom asset because it's through my sufferings I'm able to now minister to a greater number of believers and encourage them to persevere in this life as they themselves experience these life's hardships, you see. It's an asset. So it's true, brothers and sisters, your, your greatest struggle can become your greatest ministry. That's your asset. Don't look at it as a liability. That's strength and weakness. There's no real reason to feel so sorry about your broken past. Right? No matter how broken your past may be, you can trust that God can, can redeem that which is broken and and use it to encourage and comfort those who most need it. Have that vision for your life. It's okay to walk with a limp. But there's a second purpose for suffering that's also mentioned in this passage, and I want uh, to read from verse 8 to 9 one more time so we can fully grasp this together. It says, for we do not want you to be unaware, brothers, of the affliction we experienced in Asia. Check this out. For we were so utterly burdened beyond our strength that we despaired of life itself. Indeed, we felt that we had received the sentence of death. We thought we were going to die, Paul writes. But that was to make us rely not on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. You know, sometimes you hear people say, God will only give you what you can handle, right? I'm sure some of you have heard that before. And, and people who say that, they, I'm sure they have good intentions, but if you carefully think about it, that's not a true statement, okay? I mean, look again what the Apostle Paul says here, right? He, it says, he and his crew were so utterly burdened beyond their strength that they despaired of life itself. That means they came to the end of themselves and they couldn't, handle the circumstances they were in with their own resources and strength. They were done. They were exhausted of their resources. So does God only give what you can handle? No. Here's the truth. Sometimes God intentionally puts us in these impossible situations and he gives us what we cannot handle so that we can learn to rely on God and not on ourselves. That's what this passage teaches, okay? That deserves an amen. Amen? Again, you're more lively than 9 o'clock. That's good. The Apostle Paul is, again, rebutting his accusers. He's saying, you know, you think that the intense degree of my suffering disqualifies me from being an apostle, don't you? He says, no, 
you've got it wrong. Because without these intense degrees of suffering, we would not know what it means to fully trust in God in anything. This is God's lesson for us. It's by design. And notice the end result of what Paul and his true experience. It's not by their own strength that they're saved. Right? They don't save themselves. Verse 10, God delivered us from such a deadly peril. Right? On him we have set our hope that he will deliver us again. So God delivered us once, he will deliver us again. That's their hope, that's their comfort. So the saying, God will only give you what you can handle, it's not true, confusing at best. It may have originated from 1 Corinthians 10 where it says, and you know this very well, no temptation has overtaken you, right? Well, that, that is not common to man. God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond your ability, but with the temptation, he will also provide a way of escape that you may be able to endure it. But think about what this is actually saying, okay? The, this 1 Corinthians passage is meant to assure us that God will always provide a way of escape for us when we're tempted. And so we would never have to resort to sinning to escape temptation. Right? It's not that God is promising he will only give what we can handle. No, it's not what it's saying. So don't confuse the two. So church, brothers, sisters, do not, do not be surprised when you find yourselves in these impossible situations. And there's no way for you to handle the amount of hardship you're suffering. If you've never been there, you will get there soon. That's how difficult life is. You know, for some of you, that might be you trying to deal with the suffering and loss of a loved one. Right? And you're done. You're exhausted, right? You have no more resources left. And so God is calling you to recognize that your only way out is to look to him, you see. He says, yes, it's by design. And for many of you, because we're all getting older now, okay, I've warned you for many years that this time will come, right? Many of you are getting older. This impossible situation will be when you're now having to live through midlife, okay? It's going to feel like I'm done. I'm exhausted. I can't deal with this, you know, crazy spouse of mine. I can't deal with all the pressure of caring for a you know, aging parent and young kids running around all the time, not listening to me, you know, jobs too stressful, you know, ministry's asking me to like be a deacon now, it's crazy, right? Too much pressure, too much burden, I'm done, I'm exhausted, maybe that's how you're feeling. I'm telling you, it's by, it's by God's design. You are being called to look away from yourself and to look to God, who has the power to raise the dead, The second question that I wanted us to consider this morning is how can we actually find comfort in our pain and hardship when the pain and hardship's still there, you see? How does, that, how does that work exactly? Okay, I'm a practical guy, believe it or not. I like to deal with practical things. Like if I had cancer, and I don't have cancer, but if I had cancer, would God change my circumstances and take my pain away by removing the cancer. And surely he can do that. But you all know this, right? More often than not, God does not comfort us by miraculously changing our circumstances and just taking away our pain or our cancers or whatever illness or suffering you're going through. So the question is this, honestly, if God does not change our circumstances and if he doesn't take away the proverbial thorn in the flesh, then how are we to actually find comfort? How is that comforting? That's my question. And in the past, I've answered this question in a number of different ways. 
okay? I mean, I, I normally love to emphasize how the reality of God's sovereignty and how God is absolutely in control despite our own chaos is meant to comfort us, and it is comforting. I'm always comforted by that truth. You know, many years ago, there was a couple who had tragically lost their four-month-old daughter, and I remember the mom once sharing that the greatest comfort for her was in knowing that God was sovereign and in control of all things, even the life and death of her four-month-old. That was her confession. Out of all the advice, everything that she heard, the, the most comforting truth was that, God's sovereignty is sovereign. He's in control. And I'm, I'm sure for many of you, the reality of God's sovereignty is also one of the greatest sources of your own comfort in this pain-filled life. In the past, I've also answered this question by sharing how God is the one who not only has us walk through fire at times, but that he's also the one who walks with us in the fire. He is God who is present with us, right? He not only sends a storm, but he also is the God who is with us in the storms of life, right? He was with Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego in the furnace, right? There's a fourth figure, right? Behold, right? it was the angel of the Lord. It was people, they suspect it was Jesus, right? And we were also comforted by the God uh, that we, we saw in Jonah, right? While Jonah was suffering in the storm and eventually thrown into the sea, we said that there was grace in the storm and that God sometimes loves like a hurricane. But today, as much as I love those responses, and I believe those God's sovereignty and God being with us offer great comfort, today... I want to approach this question from a different angle and answer it like this, okay? The way God comforts us in our pain is by assuring us that we are walking in the same path of our Savior who walked down the path of suffering and death and eventual resurrection glory. And you may wonder how that exactly is supposed to offer any comfort, but listen carefully to the Apostle Paul because when he experienced great suffering in his own life, the thought of him sharing in the sufferings of Christ and the thought of him walking in the path of his Savior became a great source of comfort for him. He writes in Philippians chapter 3, I want to know Christ, yes, to know the power of his resurrection and participation in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death. See, it was clear in Paul's mind that the path Jesus walked is the same path that every believer has been called to, to take as well. The same path. And because Jesus' suffering and death led to the resurrection, he knew that no matter how much he himself suffered in this life. He too would experience one day the power of the resurrection for himself. And so the fact that he had to suffer so much in this life, it, it didn't discourage him. I'm sure he struggled like any of us would, but it didn't ultimately discourage him or lead him to despair. It actually, in the end, encouraged him and gave him comfort in the hope that his own resurrection was near, you see, that he was on the right path. I thought of this illustration. This is a fresh illustration, okay? I often like recycle illustrations, but this one's fresh, right? This one's fresh. How many of you enjoy a challenging hiking trail where you have the serious potential of getting lost and not finding your way down before sunset. <laughs> That's a scary thought. Right? If you ever hiked a rigorous trail. The most rigorous hiking trail that I was on was probably the trail found in the White Mountains of, of New Hampshire. 
These are the great white mountains. I mean, no joke. I mean, you can get lost, seriously, easily. I, I, I was on that trail a few times, but one year I, I decided to take uh, some of my high school seniors, not from our church here, but a uh, church in Philly, and uh, I regret it after the fact because we barely made it down on time. I, I, I thought we were going to get lost. Like, we were losing sun, and the high school seniors were not going fast enough. <laughs> But think about this with me. You know, one of the things hikers rely on the most <clears throat> are what's called trail markers. Let me, share, let me share some slides with you, all right? Here are some examples of trail markers. So you walk into the woods that say, this is not the Great White Mountains. I mean, this is, like, you know, maybe some, somewhere in Northern Virginia. <laughs> but you walk in and, you know, maybe some parts are a little confusing. So what do you look for? You look for these trail markers, usually on trees or poles, okay? And say, oh, I'm, a, I'm still on the right path. I'm on the white trail, you see? Okay? That's what I want to be on. I want to stay on the white trail. So you keep on walking. You see another white mark. Good, right? And that comforts you. Next slide. Oh, there's a double, double marker, which normally means that there are two overlapping trails, right? You're, you're on the white trail, but also you're at the same time on the red trail, okay? <laughs> and you can choose which trail you want to be on, right, once they divide. Another, another trail marker that I learned of. Next one. You guys know what this is called? These are, these, this is not called stones stacked on top of each other, okay? This is, called, <laughs> this is called a cairn, for those of you who are outdoorsy, right? You know what that is, a cairn. I just learned this. Uh, this is also a trail marker. If you're like in, in rocky terrain and, you know, it, it's better to have this sort of visible structure in place to kind of indicate whether someone's on the right trail, they do this. They, they build a cairn, okay? This is also a good, helpful trail marker. And a uh, uh, smaller version of this is on the next slide. This is a, has a different name, but the same concept. This is like a, a duck. It's called a duck, okay? So today you learn cairn and duck, right? Nothing, nothing the theological about it, but... Something helpful to know, all right? Um, so the thing is this, right? No matter how difficult and challenging the trail may be, it's like as long as you periodically see these trail markers, guess what? Would you be nervous? No, right? You would be encouraged. You would find great comfort because you know that you're on the right path still that you're not deviated. You have this assurance as well that you'll be able to reach your destination soon, that the end is near. And so my point is this, right? Just as hikers are greatly encouraged and comforted by these trail markers, we as Christians should also be greatly encouraged and comforted by our own trail markers in this faith journey that we've been called to be on to see. That makes sense? But here, here's the follow-up question. What, what do you think some of those trail markers would be for us as Christians on this journey? What do you think? Could one of those trail markers be the presence of suffering in our lives? Right? Let me remind you. 2 Timothy. Indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted, right? trail marker, Philippians 1, 29, for it has been granted to you that for the sake of Christ, you should not only believe in him, but also suffer for his sake. That's a marker of the Christian life. To have these markers present ought to encourage you and give you comfort. And so if you suffer for your faith, Brothers, sisters, it's clear evidence, okay, that you're faithfully following Jesus. So be comforted. Don't grow discouraged and fall into despair. And you know what? I don't want you to think that there's only value here in enduring through suffering that comes in the form of persecution for your faith, okay? I do want you to be, I mean, I do want you to experience that one day because we're expected to. And, and no doubt, no doubt, the Apostle Paul is mainly speaking about that kind of form of suffering in this passage, since that's what he's been mainly 
experiencing as an apostle. But see, the Bible, more broadly, and even the Apostle Paul at times, he, he does speak about suffering in more general terms. And let me just give you a couple examples from Scripture. Okay, Romans chapter 5 says, Not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings. It's more general suffering. It's not just pinpointing one kind of suffering, okay? We rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance. Endurance produces character, character, hope, okay? That's talking about all different kinds of suffering. And then James chapter 1, our famous passage, Count on all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And so it's talking about all like, various trials and sufferings hardships, cancer, okay, loss of family, all of the above. Right? These passages remind us that there is value, brothers and sisters, in faithfully enduring through sufferings of all kind because God's purpose is to offer comfort and hope for you in all of our sufferings, not just the ones that come in the form of persecution. So don't Look at your suffering in this life and take it as God's curse over you. Share the perspective of the Apostle Paul and look at these sufferings as a trail marker that's meant to comfort you by giving you the assurance that, yes, you are actually on the right path that leads to resurrection life. You are close to the end. You know, it's interesting because sometimes you meet people who suffer through far, far lesser hardships than others, but their heart is somehow devoid of joy and thankfulness. They always tend to live with this attitude of self-pity. They're always complaining about something, right? In their minds, God has cursed them, and the whole world is against them, and they ultimately become life drainers or life takers. On the other hand, you have people who suffer through far, far more than what you've ever realized. I mean, you, you hear their story, like I heard our, our, our you know, pastoral staff story, and it's, it's unbelie unbelievably tragic. And you're thinking like, how have you not turned away from God yet, you know, given your, your tragedies in life? Like, it's surprising. Yeah, you would have never imagined that they could have experienced such pain and loss because their lives, for the most part, are marked by joy and thankfulness. And they're not life drainers or life takers. They're life givers, right? They're like a tree planted by streams of water, right? No matter what season they're in, they offer shade for others. They provide rest for the weary, because their lives have become a faithful reflection of their Savior. It's amazing. That's not normal. That's supernatural. Because they're in fellowship with God. They're connected with him. They've been spent of their resources. Now their resources flow from their God. So they're ever replenished. Our passage mentions something about prayer as well. Do you know how to tell the difference between a life taker and a life giver? Life givers, they actually know how to pray. Right? You ask them to pray in whatever context, something edifying will spill out of their mouth because their hearts are saturated with Scripture. And they're always dependent upon the Lord. So they're always, in a sense, in prayer. That's the mark of a life giver. They pray more than most people because they truly believe that only God is the one who's able to deliver them from the sufferings we experience in life. They train themselves not to rely on themselves, but to rely on God every day, every day. And so I want to ask that you aspire to be life givers, not life takers or drainers. I'm not saying, I'm not saying, please, I'm not saying you can't share your life burdens with others. Life givers know how to do that too, okay? It's not like they're just all independent and perfect. No, I'm not saying that. Don't mistake the message. You can share your burdens, but 
learn to always encourage your heart and others, other people around you to go to the Lord and draw from his resources. Brothers and sisters, in closing, let me just offer this word. Let's not use our past and present sufferings to complain to others or grumble through life. Rather, let's view our past and present sufferings as these trail markers that are meant to assure us that we are, yes, we are walking in the right path and that we're close to seeing Jesus face to face. The resurrection is near. Let's live with that hope. Let's be encouraged. Amen? Pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for reminding us today that in our suffering, you are our ultimate source of comfort and strength. Give us the eyes to see beyond our own pain and to recognize that you comfort us not just for our own sake, but so that we may be comfort, we may be a comfort to others in their times of need. May we remember that we're to follow in the path of our Savior, who had endured great suffering for our sake, that through his suffering we may find ultimate comfort and hope. And in those moments when the trials and sufferings of life become too overwhelming for us to bear, teach us to rely not on our own strength, but on your power that raises the dead. And as we go from this place, may your word once again dwell richly in our hearts, guiding us and sustaining us through every trial. We pray all these things in the powerful name of Jesus. Amen.